July 9, 1850, Tabriz, Persia. An event occurred which finds its only parallel in the crucifixion of Christ 18 centuries earlier. Before a multitude of 10,000 people, a man called the Bab, the founder of a faith which had set all of Persia in turmoil, was publicly executed. It is estimated that within the six short years of his ministry, that he'd raised up a million followers. News of this event was spread throughout the world, and it so stirred the contemporary historians of the time, that many of them set out for Persia to investigate the story for themselves. Who was this man called the Bab? And why did the combined powers of the civil and ecclesiastical leaders of Persia want to kill both him and his followers? Here are the words of a great thinker of the time. This illustrious soul arose with such power that he shook the supports of the religion, of the morals, the conditions, the habits and the customs of Persia, and instituted new rules, new laws, and a new religion. Though the great personages of state, nearly all the clergy and the public men, arose to destroy and annihilate him, he alone withstood them and moved the whole of Persia. He imparted divine education to an unenlightened multitude and produced marvelous results on the thoughts, morals, customs and conditions of the Persians. The Bab's mission was to challenge the corruption of the government and the clergy of Persia and to prepare the people of his time for the coming of a great universal teacher, Baha'u'llah, who would usher in an age of peace for all people of the world. It was for this mission that he gave his life. What is the message which you have brought? To their questions, the Bob replied, I am, I am, I am the promised one. I am the one whose name you have for a thousand years invoked, at whose mention you have risen. Whose advent you have longed to witness And the hour of whose revelation You have prayed God to hasten Verily I say It is incumbent upon the peoples of both the East and the West To obey my word and to pledge allegiance to my person I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am The promised one I knew him well. He was my son. He was born on October 20, 1819 in the city of Shiraz. From the time he was a baby, I remember thinking that there was something different about him. As a child, he was always very serene and had a dignified manner. My husband died when the Bob was very young and my brother became his guardian. When it came time, for him to go to school, my brother took him. But his teacher brought him back to his uncle the following day, saying that he had nothing to teach this gifted child. He said, he stands in no need of teachers such as I. My brother was determined that the Bob should continue to attend school, and so he did. But as time went on, the schoolmaster became even more convinced of the Bob's superior intelligence. He said that he felt that in his relationship to the Bob, he was the one who was being instructed. But my son's intelligence was not the only characteristic which made him stand out from other children. The character of his devotion to God was very unique. The Bob spent a great deal of time praying and was often late for school because, as he said, he had been in his grandfather's house. You see, 
We were direct descendants of the Prophet Muhammad and this is an expression that we sometimes used for prayer. Sometimes his teacher would tell him that a 10 year old boy did not need to spend so much time praying. The Bab would say, I wish to be like my grandfather. When the Bab was 17, he went to Boucher with his uncle where he worked as a merchant for five years. My brother told me that he won the esteem of all the merchants he met because of his honesty and trustworthiness. During that time, he continued to devote a large amount of time to prayer. When the Bob returned from Boucher, he was 22. I arranged his marriage to our neighbor's daughter, Khadija. These were happy days. They were so perfect for each other. Although I did not understand it, there seemed to be a change in my son's behavior. I mean, he was always extremely courteous and very mild, but a new radiance seemed to surround him. Other people must have recognized that there was something very special about him too, for many young religious students would come to visit him in the evenings. Before long, I realized that Khadija was going to have a baby. In due time, she went into labor, but it was a very difficult labor, and I feared at one point that she was going to die. When I hurried to tell my son about the grave condition of his wife, he picked up a mirror which was beside him, and he wrote a prayer on it. He instructed me to hold the mirror in front of Khadija, I did this immediately, and the child was soon born, but its life was short. He was a boy, and the Bab named him Ahmad. When Ahmad died, I was very angry at my son. I demanded that he tell me why it was that if he possessed such powers, that he had not made an attempt to save the life of his own child. He answered very quietly that he was not destined to have any children. It was soon after this that the heart of the storm entered our lives. My son went on pilgrimage, and when he returned, the religious authorities summoned him to the mosque. They told him that he must stop his teaching. After that, we did have a few quiet months before my son moved to my brother's house. He told Khalidje that it was for our safety that he was leaving us. You know, women were not allowed to be a part of religious affairs in those days. And it was very difficult for us to learn what the religious talk of the day was. Sometimes we heard rumors of my son's claim to be the promised one. But at the time, I personally was not able to investigate this claim. It was towards the end of my life when Baha'u'llah, the one that the Bab had said he had come to prepare the way for, sent two of his followers to teach me about the wonderful station and mission of my son. It was soon after the Bab moved to my brother's house that Khadija and I heard of his arrest. You can imagine the grief and despair that we felt. We worried about him all of the time, but it was not until one year after his death that we heard about his execution. After all these years, I still can't begin to tell you how this news pained me. On that day in Tabriz, I was not with him. He claims to be the promised one of Islam and many of our best religious students are now sitting at his feet and listening to this nonsense. We must have stopped this heresy. I also knew him well. I am Khadija, the Bab's wife. We were childhood friends and as our houses were beside each other, the Bab would often visit us with his family. Usually he wouldn't join in our games, but when he did, he was always very kind and considerate. After he went to Boucher with his uncle, I had a very vivid dream 
in which I saw him standing in a field of beautiful flowers. He was facing toward Mate in an attitude of prayer, and he was wearing the beautiful coat, which was embroidered in gold thread with verses from the Quran. His face was radiant. When I told this dream to his mother and grandmother, they assured me that it was my friend, the Bob's assiduous attention to his prayer, which had brought this vision to me. He was 17 at that time. After he returned from Boucher to live in Shiraz again, I had another dream, which puzzled me. I dreamed that Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, had come to ask for my hand in marriage to her son, the Imam Hussein. When I woke up, I told my mother and she said that this dream foretold good fortune for me. That same day, the Bob's mother and grandmother came to visit my mother. I served them some fruit and tea, and then I left the room. Before our company left, the Bob's mother kissed my forehead. My mother told me that this kiss signified that the Bob's mother was asking for my hand in marriage to her son. She said, You see, the dream you had last night came true. From that day, I felt a great stirring in my heart. I felt immeasurably proud of my coming union. We were married in his home two months later. It was August 1842. I remember the first few months as the happiest days of my life. His care and kindness towards me were indescribable. Both he and his mother showered me with kindness and consideration. Not long after, however, I dreamt one night that a fearsome lion was standing in the courtyard of our house, and I had my arms around his neck. The beast dragged me twice around the entire perimeter to our courtyard and once again around half of it. I woke up, alarmed and trembling with fright, and told my husband about it. He said, you awoke too soon. Your dream foretells that our life together will not last more than two and a half years. I was greatly distressed, but his affection and words of comfort consoled me and must have prepared me to accept the adversity which lay ahead. First came the death of our son. I so wanted a child. And when Ahmad died, the Bob again gave me comfort and solace. He said that Ahmad was with Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, in the sanctified paradise. One day in the late afternoon, he came home earlier than usual. That evening he said he had a particular task to attend to. So we had an early dinner with the family in his mother's room, and he retired for the night. An hour later, when the house was quiet and all were asleep, he rose from his bed and left the room. At first I took no particular notice of his absence, but when it lengthened to more than an hour, I felt some concern. I looked for him, but he was nowhere to be found. Then I walked to the western side of the house, looked up at the rooftop and saw that the upper chamber was well lit. So with some trepidation, I went up the steps at the northern side of the courtyard. There I saw him standing in that chamber. His hands raised heavenwards, intoning a prayer in the most melodious voice, with tears streaming down his face. And his face, his face was luminous, rays of light radiating from it. He looked so majestic and resplendent that fear seized me and I stood transfixed where I was, trembling uncontrollably. I could neither enter the room nor retrace my steps. My willpower was gone, and I was on the point of screaming when he made a gesture with his blessed hands, telling me to go back. This movement of his hands gave me back my courage, and I returned to my room and my bed. Sleep was impossible, and the coming dawn was foreboding. At sunrise, he went to his mother's room for tea. 
I followed him there, and as soon as my eyes fell on him, that same attitude and majesty which I had seen the night before took shape before me. He raised his face to me, and with great kindness asked me to sit beside him. Then he passed to me what was left of the tea in his own cup, which I drank. He gently asked what was troubling me, to which I replied, You are no longer the same person I knew in our childhood. We grew up together, and we have been married for two years living in this house. And now I see a different person before me. You have been transformed, and it makes me anxious and uneasy. He smiled at me and said that although he wished that I hadn't seen him in the condition of the previous night, God had ordained otherwise. It was the will of God, he said, that you should have seen me in the way you did last night, so that no shadow of doubt should ever cross your mind, and you should know with absolute certitude that I am the manifestation of God whose advent has been invoked for a thousand years. This light radiates from my heart and from my being. As soon as I heard him speak these words, I believed in him, and my heart became calm and assured. From that moment, I lived only to serve him, evanescent and self-effacing before him, no thought of myself ever intruding. It is very difficult for me to talk about what came after. Fierce, fierce opposition. As his claim became known, as many people became attracted to him, the greater the denial of the priests and government leaders. They arrested him one night, and it was rumored that they would put him to death. That same night, a cholera epidemic suddenly struck Shiraz, taking a heavy toll of lives. Many people fled the city, including the governor. The Bob's life was spared. They said he saved the life of the son of the man who was to put him to death. One day, to our incredible joy, he came home and stayed three days. These were the last days of my life with him. On the last night, he said he was leaving the city. We were happy that he might reach a place of safety. The family kept us informed of his whereabouts. Unfortunately, he was arrested again. He was taken to various prisons, and then to Tabriz. Before he left Shiraz, he had confided to me the secret of his future suffering, and unfolded to my eyes the significance of the events that were to transpire in his day. He gave me a special prayer, revealed and written by himself. He said, "In the hour of your perplexity, recite this prayer ere you go to sleep. I myself will appear to you, and will banish your anxiety." I found this to be absolutely true. Every time that I turned to him in prayer, the light of his unfailing guidance illumined my path and resolved my problems. My greatest happiness came when I recognized the great one that my husband had given his life for, Baha'u'llah. I believe that the Bab guided me to see this truth. So you see, those years with him were so wonderful. The rest is history. I only wish that I could have been with him. On that day in Tabriz. Is it blasphemy against God? Is it blasphemy against the religion of God? We can no longer tolerate his lies. We must warn the Shah and put an end to this. My name is Dr. Cormac. I met the Bab a few times in the central prison of Tabriz. Where I worked as a physician for the court of the Shah, a fellow colleague of mine, Dr. Larabi, wrote to me and asked me to tell him about the details of my interview with the prisoner. I will read to you my reply. 
You have asked me in your letter for some particulars of my interview with the founder of the sect, known as Barbies. Nothing of any importance transpired in this interview, as the Bab was aware of my having been sent with two other Persian doctors to see whether he was of sane mind or merely a madman to help decide the question whether to put him to death or not. With this knowledge, he was loath to answer any question put to him. To all inquiries, he merely regarded us with a mild look, chanting in a melodious voice some hymns, I suppose. Two other Sayyids, descendants of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, his intimate friends, were also present, besides a couple of government officials. He only deigned to answer me on my saying that I was not a Muslim and was willing to know something about his religion, as I might perhaps be inclined to adopt it. He regarded me very intently on my saying this and replied that he had no doubt of all Europeans coming over to his religion. Our report to the Shah at that time was of a nature to spare his life. He was put to death some time after by order of the Prime Minister. On our report, he merely got the bastinado, basically a beating of the feet by two sticks, one on each end of a leather rope, in which operation a farosh or guard, whether intentionally or not, struck him across the face with a stick destined for his feet. On being asked whether a Persian surgeon should be brought to treat him, he expressed a desire that I should be sent for, and I accordingly treated him for a few days. But in the interviews consequent on this, I could never get him to have a confidential chat with me, as some government people were always present, he being a prisoner. He was very thankful for my attentions to him. He was a very mild and delicate looking man, rather small in stature and very fair for a Persian, with a melodious soft voice, which struck me very much. Being a descendant of Muhammad, he was dressed in the habit of that lineage, as were also his two companions. In fact, his whole look and deportment went far to dispose one in his favor. Of his doctrine, I heard nothing from his own lips, although the idea was that there existed in his religion a certain approach to Christianity. He was seen by some Armenian carpenters who were sent to make some repairs on his prison, reading the Bible, and he took no pains to conceal it, but on the contrary told them of it. Most assuredly, the Muslim fanaticism does not exist in his religion, as applied to Christians, nor is there that restraint of females that now exists. This concludes my impressions. I hope you find them helpful. Yours sincerely, Dr. Cormick. My name is Mullah Hussein. I was the first to believe in the Bab. I had been a student of two great teachers in Persia, whose mission had been to prepare as many people as possible for the coming of the Promised One. After their deaths, I fasted and prayed for 40 days to prepare myself to find the Promised One. I felt drawn as if by a magnet, first to the city of Boucher and then to the city of Shiraz. As I approached the gate of that city, a youth of radiant countenance, wearing a green turban, advanced toward me with a smile of loving welcome. He embraced me with tender affection, as though he had been my intimate and lifelong friend. He invited me to his house, and there, he showed me the greatest hospitality. With no prompting, he asked me what signs my teachers had told me to look for, in my search for the Promised One. I told him that I was looking for someone between the ages of 20 and 30, of medium height, who was a direct descendant of Muhammad, abstained from smoking, was free of bodily deficiency, and most important, was endowed with innate knowledge. There was a silence, after which he spoke these words. Behold, all these signs are manifest in me. I was stunned. He then considered each of the aforementioned signs separately and conclusively demonstrated that each and all were applicable to his person. I politely observed, he whose advent we await is a man of unsurpassed holiness and the cause he is to reveal a cause of tremendous power my own knowledge is but a drop compared to that with which he has been endowed. All my attainments 
are but a speck of dust in the face of the immensity of his knowledge. As soon as I said these words, a sense of fear and remorse came over me. I resolved to take a more humble approach. The Bob then took up his pen, and chanting the words as he wrote them, he revealed all the answers to the questions I had been unable to resolve. The overpowering effect of the manner in which he wrote was heightened by the gentle intonation of his voice which accompanied his writing. Not for one moment did he interrupt the flow of the verses which streamed from his pen. I sat in rapture by the magic of his voice and the sweeping force of his revelation. When he finished writing, it was two hours and eleven minutes after sunset on May 22nd, 1844. I had no further need of proof. Can you imagine my feelings? After this long and arduous search, I had found the promised one. He then addressed me in these words. O thou who art the first to believe in me, verily I say I am the Bob, the gate of God, and thou art the gate of that gate. Eighteen souls must in the beginning, spontaneously and of their own accord, accept me and recognize the truth of my revelation. Unwarned and uninvited, each of these must seek independently to find me. We shall appoint unto each of the eighteen souls a special mission. He asked me to go to Tehran, where I would find a great mystery, a source of great knowledge. All that he spoke to me that night came true. The eighteen souls whom he called Letters of the Living discovered him and he sent us throughout Persia to teach his cause. The opposition was unbelievable. The power of our faith was greater. Thousands of people accepted his teachings and thousands died at the hands of the government and clergy. At a place called Fort Tabarsi, I with 313 companions tried to defend our faith and our lives. The Shah sent 6,000 soldiers against us. We held our ground for nine months, and then on February 1st, 1849, I gave my life for the Bob's cause. I only wish that I could have been with him on that day in Tabriz. We have just received news that the most learned amongst us, Sahih, was sent by the Shah to investigate the claims of this Baal, and he never returned. He has been fooled by this, this upstart from Shiraz. I is now copying the verses of his mischief maker. I am named Tahire, the Pure One. Another of my names is Kuratul Ain, Consolation of the Eyes. I was considered beautiful in this world, but I was interested in a higher beauty, the beauty of the spiritual world. Of the eighteen letters of the living, I am the only woman. I recognized the Bob in a dream. The effulgence of thy face flashed forth, and the rays of thy visage arose on Am I not your Lord? Yea, that thou art, let us make reply. At the gates of my heart, I behold the feet and the tents of the host of calamity. God's great gift to me was my inner sight. I knew the Bob's teachings were true. I knew that he and his teachings were from God. When I became a follower of the Bob, my husband tried to poison me. He divorced me and took my three children away from me. The Shah of Persia desired me for a bride. I like her looks. Leave her and let her be, he said. He wanted me for a bride on the condition that I deny my faith. I refused him, saying, I worship not that which ye worship, and ye do not worship that which I worship. I shall never worship that which ye worship, 
neither will ye worship that which I worship. To you be your religion, to me my religion. I was born into a time and place where women were shut up behind veils and behind walls, like voiceless ghosts, deprived of food for their minds and souls. It was believed that women did not possess souls. It seemed insanely absurd to me that half the human race should be thus imprisoned. When I knew that women were as intelligent as men, and in the qualities of mercy and intuition superior, I spent my short life dedicated to their education. Inspired by the Bab, I taught groups of women in their households the lessons of the mind, the spirit, and the heart. When men were present, I spoke from behind a curtain. One day, before an assemblage of men, I removed my veil. The shock was so great that one man slit his own throat. In removing my veil, I removed the veil for all women, for all time. It was a spiritual as well as a physical act. Now the doors leading to the Valley of Fulfillment are open, not just for women but for all humanity. Those doors can never be closed. God has destined it. I was always persecuted and finally imprisoned. I knew the day I was to die. I adorned myself in a gown of pure white. I fasted and chanted away the pain and ecstasy of that day. It was painful because I am human, and ecstatic because my love for the Bob drew me upwards towards himself. I was strangled by a drunken man and thrown into a well. Now I shall be a well for you. I will inspire you with the right thought, the right words, the right decision, at the right moment. All you need to do is sincerely ask. My last words on earth were these. You can kill me as soon as you like, but you may not stop the emancipation of women. Alas, that I could not have been with my beloved when his soul ascended to God on that day in Tabriz. I was with him. I was with him. I am Anis Sunusi, and I was living in Tabriz when they brought the Bob there. You see, when I was in my teens, I had heard about the Bob, and I was so attracted to his teachings that I became his follower. But my stepfather would not allow me to meet him or voice my allegiance to the Bob. He even locked me up as a prisoner in my own home so that I could not see him. But my fortunes changed, and that is why I am so happy. One day, as I lay confined in my cell, my room, I turned my heart towards him and prayed. These were the words of my prayer. Oh God, you can see my captivity and helplessness. And you know how eager I am to see your face. Dispel this gloom that oppresses my heart with the light of your radiant face. <laughs> I shed tears and tears and more tears. I was so overcome with emotion that I seemed to have lost consciousness. Suddenly I heard a voice. I knew it was the voice of the Bob. He was calling me, Anis Sanusi, arise. I saw the majesty of his face as he appeared before me. He smiled as he looked into my eyes. I rushed forward and flung myself at his feet. Be happy, he said. The hour is approaching. When, in this very city of Tabriz, I shall be suspended before the eyes of the multitude and shall fall a victim to the fire of the enemy. I shall choose no one except you to share with me the cup of martyrdom. Rest assured that this promise which I give you 
shall be fulfilled. On July the 8th, I escaped from my stepfather's house. And barefoot, I ran to the center of Tabriz, confident that I would find the Bob. The streets were full of people, and the commotion surrounding him, incredible. The whole city was in turmoil. The Bob's death warrant had been announced, and the people were trying to get a glimpse of him. He was being escorted by soldiers from the house of the governor to the central square when I found him. I broke through the ranks of the soldiers. And just as in my dream, I threw myself at his feet. I cried out, send me not from thee, O master. Wherever you go, let me follow you. He said, Anis Sanusi, arise, and rest assured that you will be with me. Tomorrow, you shall witness what God has decreed. That night, we were taken to a room on the edge of the central square in Tabriz. There were the Bob, his secretary, Syed Hussein, and I in the small room, with many soldiers guarding the door. The atmosphere in that room I shall never forget. The Bob was so happy. He knew that he would be executed the next day. And he spoke about knowing that his mission on earth had been accomplished. Despite the opposition of the divines and the government, no power had succeeded in quenching the flame of faith that his word had set ablaze. The coming of Baha'u'llah had been his constant theme, and he addressed him in these words, O thou remnant of God, Baha'u'llah, I have sacrificed myself wholly for thee. I have accepted curses for thy sake, and have yearned for naught but martyrdom in the path of thy love. Just before noon, July 9th, the Bob was giving his last instructions to his secretary when the attendant came to take him to his execution. What are you still doing here? You have been waiting around here since yesterday. We have business with your friend here. Get out! When the attendant interrupted the Bob's conversation with his secretary, the Bob said to him, Not until I have said all those things that I wish to say can any earthly power silence me. Though all the world be armed against me, yet shall they be powerless to deter me from fulfilling to the last word my intention. <laughs> I am Sam Fun, and I profess the Christian faith. I have orders to execute you, but I have no ill will against you. If your cause be the cause of truth, then enable me to free myself from the obligation to shed your blood. The Bob replied, follow your instructions, and if your intention be sincere, the Almighty is surely able to relieve you of your perplexity. <laughs> As soon as the smoke cleared away, an astounded multitude were looking upon a scene which their eyes could scarcely believe. There, standing before them, was Anis Sanusi, while the Bob had vanished from their sight. The ropes by which their bodies had been suspended were severed by the bullets, yet their bodies had escaped the fire of the three regiments. 
But Bob has gone from our sight, shouted the voices of the bewildered onlookers. The guards began a frenzied search for the Bob, and they found him, sitting with his secretary in the cell he'd occupied the night before, calmly continuing his previously interrupted conversation. There was an expression of unruffled calm on his face. His body had emerged unscathed from the shower of bullets fired at him. I have finished my conversation with Sayed Hussein, the Bob told the attendant. Now you may proceed to fulfill your intention. The attendant was too shaken to resume what he had already attempted. Refusing to continue, he left the scene and resigned his post. Sam Khan was likewise stunned by the force of this moment and ordered his regiment to leave the barracks. He refused his superior's command to continue and left. Agajan Khani Khamsi, head of the bodyguard, volunteered to carry out the execution and a new regiment was brought in. On the same wall and in the same manner, the Bob and Ani Sanusi were suspended. Just before the order to fire, the Bob spoke to the gazing multitude. O oh, wayward generation, had you believed in me, every one of you would have followed the example of this youth, Ani Sanusi, who stood in rank above most of you and willingly would have sacrificed himself in my path. The day will come when you will have recognized me. That day, I shall have ceased to be with you. Agajan Khani Khamse gave the command to fire. Regiment 1, ready, fire! Regiment 2, ready, fire! Regiment 3, ready, fire! The very moment the shots were fired, a gale of exceptional severity arose and swept over the whole city. A whirlwind of dust of incredible density obscured the light of the sun, and this continued until dusk. The bodies were then taken and dumped unceremoniously by a moat outside the gates of the city. Soldiers guarded them through the night. On the morning following the day of the martyrdom, the Russian consul in Tabriz, accompanied by an artist, went to that spot and ordered that a sketch be made of the remains as they lay beside the moat. It was such a faithful portrait of the Bob. No bullet had struck his forehead, his cheeks, or his lips. A smile seemed to still be lingering upon his countenance. His body, however, had been severely mutilated. You could recognize the arms and head of his companion, who seemed to be holding him in his embrace. Be with him today. I wanna be with him. 